Thank you very much. Also, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians. Um, this series of seminars, and this is the tenth of a series of ten, so it's the very last one, um, and we've conducted them throughout New South Wales, regional and uh, metropolitan areas. And the reason we're doing this is because with the Cognitive Decline Partnership Centre, probably about four or five years ago now, we received a large grant of money um, and from the National Health and Medical Research Council and we were looking at projects that would assist people with dementia and as a, a legal practitioner um, my project was looking at whether financial institutions actually recognise powers of attorney. Basically, it's as simple as that, and what the experience was of the consumer, and in this respect, the consumer was the person who was the attorney, who had either acted on the power of attorney, or attempted to act on the power of attorney. And we discovered that financial institutions, because it was policies and practices, financial institutions all had policies that said, yes, they did, recognise them, but the practice from which we found out was basically not this bank or that bank or this branch or that branch, it was whoever the teller was at that particular time. And that was the experience we did hear from the financial sector, but also from the attorneys. And we also wanted to know what the attorneys' knowledge about powers of attorney and their role actually was. And sometimes the knowledge was perhaps a little bit wanting. And so we've done this series of seminars and we do find that the questions that are asked in the seminar um, do demonstrate that powers of attorney are not really widely understood. So when you have a question at the end, by all means ask it, no matter whether you think, oh, I can't really ask that. Um, because I've always believed that if you want to ask it, a lot of other people in the room also want to ask it, and they're grateful that you ask it. So the start of these seminars, we had a focus group hosted by COTA, and the focus group looked at my presentation and me, and then came up with some suggestions, which when you were my age and you've been doing this for so long was confronting, but it was fantastic because one of the things we did do was change almost the first um, slide, which we're about to see, and that slide was looking at what a power of attorney was not. So before I even start, there are some things we need to make quite clear about powers of attorney, and that is they're not just for old people. Once we turn 18, or our kids or our grandkids turn 18, it is something we should talk to them about. The other thing is that there's no law, as you'll see as we go through, that says we have to have one of these documents. However, there are laws that say what will happen if we lose capacity and we haven't actually appointed someone as our attorney. And when I say they're not just for older people, if we're trying to sell powers of attorney to younger people, we do it along the lines when you're backpacking around Nepal and you can't get a signal on your phone, um, then you might need to have someone back home with the power of attorney who could look after your financial affairs. So, oh, we didn't turn it back on, Lisa. Oh, dear, lost credibility already. <laughs> um, okay, so Lisa has said about COTA, um, it's a peak organisation for people over 50 in New South Wales. It is actually a national organisation. And the Cognitive Decline Partnership Centre, as I said, aims to improve the lives of people with cognitive and related functional decline um, with older people by communicating and implementing research. And so this is a result, the seminars of my research. So how do we actually keep control of our finances? So this is a result of the focus group. A power of attorney is a legal document where we appoint an attorney to manage our financial and say certain legal affairs. Now, a power of attorney 
is not a will. Will is what we prepare, uh, looking at who we're going to give our assets to after we have died. So wills are really only for dead people. It's not an enduring guardianship. Enduring guardianship is when we can choose to appoint someone to be our enduring guardian so they can look after our personal and health matters when we are either totally or partially incapacitated. And a power of attorney is not an advanced care directive, sometimes known as a living will, which is a, a document that we can prepare um, about the treatment we would, the medical treatment we would want or not want if we were to lose mental capacity and not be able to communicate. So a power of attorney is not those things. They are not interchangeable. It is something to do with finances um, and or legal matters. So as I said, we and we, the people who are preparing these documents, are known as the principal. And we can appoint one or more persons, or it could even be an organisation, and those people are known <coughs> as the attorney. Not the American term attorney for a lawyer, but just they're an attorney. To act on our behalf for financial and legal matters. Now, powers of attorney can be general or enduring. And we can choose which one we want. The issue is a general power of attorney ceases to have any effect if we've lost mental capacity. So some people might appoint someone as their attorney through a general power of attorney if they're just going overseas for a short holiday and something might need to be signed in their absence, okay? Whereas an enduring power of attorney it's not, because I teach law students, by the way, and I teach this three times a year. Okay. Um, an enduring power of attorney, it's not that it only comes into effect when we've lost capacity. We can say when we want it to come into effect. Um, but it endures on. It continues to be effective after we have lost mental capacity. So the term enduring as you see, will apply both to enduring guardianship for personal health matters only when the person's lost capacity, but enduring in the context of a power of attorney just means it continues on after we have lost capacity. Mm -hmm. We live in a federal system of government and nothing is going to change that, so we have to work within those confines. So powers of attorney are governed by state and or territory legislation. And as with anything that's state and territory, there are minor variations on the theme. Most states will have something in the Powers of Attorney Act that states that it will recognise powers of attorney made somewhere else, as long as they're valid back there, and also that we have the same laws. And bit by bit, mainly, we do have the same laws now. But if we're going to move around interstate, then uh, we might want to check up on the powers of attorney. That's if we have them. So how can a power of attorney assist our choices? Well, we, over the age of 18 and of sound mind, can choose who we wish to appoint as our attorney. We can choose when the power of attorney is to come into effect. And that doesn't matter whether it's general or enduring. We get a list of choices, including other. So I, for example, have appointed someone as my attorney pursuant to an enduring power of attorney. And I said I wanted it to come into effect immediately, not because I thought I'd lost capacity or anything, but just to make life simple. And to give you an example of that, um, up until about 18 months ago, I lived in Sydney and I decided I would have a tree change and move to a rural area. And so I wanted to put my place on the market, an apartment. 
And the agent said he thought it would sell in two weeks. And I thought, well, you know, who wouldn't want their place to sell in two weeks? However, I was going overseas a few days after the phone call. So I rang my attorney and I said, I've decided to sell. My agent thinks that the place will sell in a couple of weeks. And I'm going overseas in a couple of days. And you're my attorney. So, bye. So he rang back and he said, so you'd like me to register the power of attorney, would you? And that's something we'll see because you don't have to register a power of attorney and this is the real problem. <coughs> you only have to register it if the attorney is going to engage in sort of buying or selling property using the power of attorney. Then it gets registered you know, with land and property but other than that, it doesn't. So it raises the issue, how does anyone even know that a power of attorney is in existence? Mommy. Or if it's the most recent one. So just keep that at the back of your mind. So we can choose when it's to come into effect. Now we can state how the attorneys are to act if we've got more than one. In my case, I have one attorney, so it's not an issue and I have a substitute attorney if something should happen to my first attorney. So we can say we want them to act jointly, which means they have to do everything together. They have to sign everything together, they have to agree on everything together, and so we need to think, well, first and foremost, they have to get on together. And sometimes it's not as easy as it sounds. Or they can act separately, which means if one's away or one is busy or can't do something, then the other attorney can actually take care of matters. Once again, they need to get on well because you don't want a situation <laughs> where one goes away, the other is left looking after things. And when the other attorney comes back and says, you didn't tell me you sold mum's house while I was away. So we need to choose our attorneys very carefully and we'll look at some of the attributes that I believe an attorney should have. We can put limitations on a power of attorney. We don't have to just give them carte blanche. We can say, I don't, and this is an example I have used for so long, I really need to update the amount of money, but I do not want my attorney to engage in any financial transactions of more than $5,000 without providing written evidence from the accountant that, you know, that they've discussed. I mean, that's an example. Or we could say, I do not want my attorney to ever sell my principal place of residence. And you can think, well, that's a good idea. But what if the person needed to go into aged care at some stage and they needed that place, to, you know, the money from it, because they needed it for the rat, the um, refundable accommodation deposit. So powers of attorney really need a lot of thought put into them as to you know, who we're going to have and all of these issues. Now we can authorise the attorneys to give gifts and you might say, well, why would I want to do that? And that's most people's immediate reaction. But what if everything is in the principal's name and the attorney is one partner in the relationship? And how would they then live if they couldn't access the money? So gifts include, you know, sort of maintenance and education <coughs> for the person, it might be the attorney, or it might be a third party that you would name, such as the children. Or if the principal is a grandparent and always gave the grandchildren gifts of a seasonal nature, Christmas, birthdays, then um, unless the principal has authorised the giving of gifts, then the attorney could not give gifts to the grandchildren or whoever else that the grandparent, who was the principal, actually wanted the gifts to be given to. It does raise an issue. I'm not cynical, I'm a realist. And I'm a realist because I hear so many stories in the community. 
And so it's not uncommon for people to appoint their adult children, say, perhaps one as the attorney, and they've ticked the gift box, as it were, and so the one who's the child, who's the attorney, gives their kids a two-wheeler bike for Christmas from Grandma, but gives their nieces and nephews a ten dollar book voucher. <laughs> so we can see situations like this. So it's a case of thinking, well, who would I want the attorney to be able to give gifts to? Now it's important to know that we can revoke or cancel the power of attorney at any stage as long as we have mental capacity. So it may be that the person we appointed, we're not so sure that they're doing a good job, or the person may have gone overseas, they, they may have predeceased us. There can be any number of reasons that we want to change who our attorney is. And we can. Um, land and property information have a simple one-page revocation form. Yeah? I, uh, so-and-so, hereby revoke the power of attorney made by me on such and such a date and appointing so-and-so as my attorney. If we revoke it, we can't be worried about someone's feelings. We have to actually give them a copy of the revocation. Oh yes, I revoked it, but I didn't want to tell them in case they got upset. Well, if that's the case, they can still pick their, the attorney and still act on it. Also, if we revoke it, we need to give a copy of that revocation to anyone who has a copy of the power of attorney. So it might be the bank, the credit union, whoever it is. So we need to make sure that they know that we have dare I say, changed our mind. So what are the responsibilities of an attorney? Sometimes people say, as it's a badge of honour, oh, I've been appointed an executor of a will. And I think you have been given a mantle of hard work um, and conflict, probably. And the same with an attorney. It's not easy being an attorney for someone and looking after their affairs and not mixing them with our own. So they have to act, they, the attorney, in accordance with the instructions in the power of attorney. They can't say, oh, look, mum or whoever has put this in there, but I don't think that's the way to go about it. I'll just do this. No, they have to follow the instructions in the power of attorney. They have to act in the best interests of the principal at all times. So if it's a child, they can't think of the end result, like mum or dad dying, and what their inheritance is going to be. Well, you know, mum wants this, but I don't think that's a good idea because that might reduce my inheritance. And we do hear lots of cases of this. So we have to act in the principal's best interest. Attorneys can't benefit financially from being an attorney. Sure, they can get reasonable expenses, but you know, if they and the principal live in Sydney, for example, it's not in the principal's best interest for the attorney to use the money to go on a trip to London or something, just to look at London bridge or something. Um, so the attorney cannot benefit financially. They can't just help themselves to a bit of the money with the argument, dad would always have given this. Dad would always have paid the kids school fees for us because he knew we were struggling and you know, 60,000 a year for school fees, you know, is a lot and we can't afford it. So I'll just take that money from the account. No, it's not set out. If it's set out in the power of attorney that they want the school fees paid for, yeah, that's fine. But if it's not, you can't just do it. The attorneys must understand their <coughs> obligations. So just accepting being an attorney for someone is not the end of the matter. You know, we have to really know 
what our obligations are, and that is acting in accordance with the instructions, not benefiting financially, and acting in the best interest. Now, the attorneys can resign at any stage because it's all too much or for whatever reason, but once the principal loses mental capacity, the attorney can't just resign. The attorney's got to go to what's called the Guardianship Division of NCAT, the New South Wales Civil and Administrative Tribunal, the old Guardianship Tribunal, <laughs> um, and they have to make an application to be removed as the attorney. And the idea is that you can't leave the person who's lost mental capacity or has cognitive impairment, you can't leave them high and dry without anyone to look after them if the person, when they had capacity, appointed them and thought, well, this will take care of the fact should I lose capacity. Now, what should you keep in mind when appointing an attorney? Now, this is not set in legislation. This is the world according to Sue Field. These are the attributes that I think you look at or we should look at. A couple of things, and I'll reiterate, that if you've appointed your attorney under a general power of attorney, it will cease to have effect after we lose capacity. And keep in mind, not everyone loses capacity. I mean, statistically, you know, I think it's if we're 65 years of age, we might have a 1 in 15 chance. If we're 80, it might be about 1 in 9. But when we're 85, it could be one in four, okay? So we don't, not all automatically lose mental capacity. So we're just looking to situations where we may lose it or we may travel extensively or whatever. But if we do lose capacity, we need to have an enduring power of attorney in place. And that's what I've said there. Now, People say, well, who should I appoint? And I think that's the wrong question. I think the question we have to ask ourselves first is, what attributes would I want in an attorney? And when we look at the attributes, then we might then turn our mind to, well, who has these attributes? And it may not be our firstborn. It may not be our son. It may not be our daughter. It may not be our spouse in some situations. So we need to make sure, this is according to me, that our attorney's got integrity, that they're honest, because no one checks up on an attorney. I've said that you don't have to register a power of attorney unless the attorney is going to engage in property dealings. But some people do register them just so that there is a record. Most people will say, I just paid the lawyer $300. You want me to go now and pay another, what, $137 or something to register this? <laughs> no, so most people, from what we understand, don't register them. And you notice I'm a bit vague about some of these things because we've got no idea how many powers of attorney are in existence. You can't say, oh, well, so many have been downloaded from the web. So what? I download hundreds of them for the students so that they can practice doing them. That would skew the statistics. Um, so we have to have someone we trust implicitly um, to manage our finances. I mean, they could manage them while we have capacity, um, but in which case they wouldn't be doing it unless they've discussed it with us, the same as me selling my place and getting the attorney to do all the grunt work. Because if they can't look after their own money, why do you think they could look after ours? And that's a question we have to sort of think about. It's not like, oh, here I've been saying this on record, it's not like Pentecost. If they're appointed an attorney, this knowledge is not just going to pop on their head. If they couldn't manage finances before being appointed an attorney, why do we think <laughs> they'll be able to manage them once they've become an attorney? 
they need to be available. And by available, I mean they've got to be willing to do it. Don't say, I've decided to make you my attorney. <coughs> well, I don't want to be your attorney, you know, it's hard work. So they have to be willing to do it, but also, and there's no law about any of these, but I believe they need to be geographically available. Here we are, you know, on the northern beaches. Do we really want an attorney who lives in, say, Burnie in Tasmania? And you can say, oh, but with the internet now, you know, it's all just so easy. It's like being in the same room. No, that's only if you've got a signal. I live just over the other side of the Blue Mountains. And we don't get a signal all the time. And I did not even consider that when I moved there. So having someone that is readily available is very important. And this next one as it was, is as a result of the focus group, and that is advocacy skills. What if you have appointed one of your kids and some of the other kids are more domineering? They've been domineering since they were in the nursery. And so you want the attorney to be able to stand up for the rights of the principal. No, mum would not have wanted that. Um, or no, dad always said, you know, to watch out that you might do this. No, I'm acting for mum or dad or whoever it is, and I'm acting in their best interest, and it is not in their best interest for you to have 50 grand to do some work on your own home. Okay, so if you've got someone who can't stand up to the more domineering members of the family, then you might end up with a problem. And an attorney must understand their role and the consequences of not doing the right thing. So when you look at those attributes, then you might think, oh, well, I'd always thought I'd have so-and-so as the attorney, but, oh, God, they're always hitting me for a bit of money because they're short for their rent or whatever. Are they really the person to have? Or, look, they are honest, but, you know, sometimes they just don't quite get what's theirs and what's not theirs. Or, you know, they're always off somewhere where they're uncontactable. Yeah. Um, and, oh, look, so-and-so's got all these, but she's never been able to stand up to her brothers or something. So look at those. It's your choice, of course. But look at those attributes and think, OK, now I'll look at who I think could be my attorney. So as I said at the very outset, a power of attorney is not a will. Wills are for dead people. Powers of attorney cease to exist once we die. They don't continue on for a few days after death. So sometimes you might hear horror stories of an attorney where the principal has just died. I like to think the attorney is so overcome with grief that when they go to the bank, they forget that the power of attorney doesn't exist or that they should tell the bank that the person's died and they clean out the account. So, and the bank's not going to know because the bank's not going to see the death certificate until a bit later on. Um, so powers of attorney die with us. The minute we die, that's the end of the power of attorney. So it's no good saying, oh, I don't need one of those powers of attorney because my executive will take care of it. Executives take care of things after we have died. Or people say, oh, I don't need a will because my power of attorney will take care of it. Well, no, only while we're alive. So we can appoint someone as our enduring guardian for personal and health matters. Now, if we choose not to appoint someone as our attorney pursuant to an enduring power of attorney, the one that continues on after we've lost capacity, 
If we haven't done that and we do lose capacity, there's no fallback position. So I might ask you, who do you think can look after your finances in that event? And inevitably someone will say, oh, my, my wife, my husband, or depending on the culture, it might be my firstborn son. No, no one has got a God-given or a legal right to make financial decisions for us after we've lost capacity unless we have appointed them as an attorney with an enduring power of attorney. Because what happens is, you might say, oh, but our house is in joint names. It's not a problem. Well, it is, no matter how it is, if you're going to sign mortgage documents. Um, the car, everything, the bank, everything's in joint names. And then I always use this example. How many of us have tried to deal with a major telco when the phone is not in our name? And that's the example that most people can resonate with. Don't worry about the high-flying things, the day-to-day -day issue. So it will only happen if we have an enduring power of attorney, okay, if the person's lost capacity. Because what happens if we haven't got this document? Someone has to make an application to the guardianship division of NCAP for a financial manager to be appointed. Now that financial manager may not be the person that we would choose ourselves. And as I often say, how many of us have not got one kid that doesn't scrub up better than the others in a public forum and look really good and sound really good, but is not necessarily the one that we would appoint to look after our finances. So that's the money side, but with the enduring guardianship, there is a fallback position. So if we haven't gone to a solicitor and filled out an enduring guardianship form and appointed someone to make personal and health decisions for us, if we've lost capacity, then under the Guardianship Act, which is the New South Wales legislation, um, there is a fallback position called person responsible. And it's a pecking order, it's a hierarchy. And the top one in this hierarchy is someone who is uh, an enduring guardian or someone who has been appointed as a guardian by the tribunal. But then the pecking order goes down to a spouse in a close and continuing relationship, and provided they're not under a guardianship order. Then it's someone who has care of the person, and that doesn't mean a medico or you know, the blue nurse or someone. It's someone who's been a carer for the person living with them usually. Or it's a close friend or family member. And you can say, well, that's great. I, you know, there is a fallback position, so therefore I don't actually need an enduring guardianship. No, there is the fallback position. But if you think about that pecking order, then the person at the top must resign and say, no, I don't want it or I don't want to do it. But when we get down to a close friend or family member, then everyone has what we call equal standing. So you can think perhaps of a close situation or one you've heard of or one I'm going to explain to you, and that is that I'm mum's person represent person responsible. No, I'm mum's person responsible. I'll be making the decisions. No, I'll be making the decisions. So how does it work out? You might say, well, surely not every family is like this. Well, I understand that they're not, but I also understand that when you're a solicitor in practice, people do not come into your office and pay 500 an hour to tell you how happy their family is. They only come in when their family is not so happy and something has gone wrong. 
So we don't have to appoint anyone as our enduring guardian. It's our choice. But then we face the consequences of, well, I know the kids don't get on. They've got totally different views about, you know, how I think I should be looked after or where I should live or whatever. So it's up to us to decide whether we're going to appoint someone as an enduring guardian. And even though there is the fallback position, if using the good legal term of when the dog fight breaks out, someone has to make an application to the tribunal for the tribunal to appoint someone as a guardian. And if they're all there warring in front of the tribunal, the tribunal is going to say it won't matter who we appoint, it's not going to work in this family. We've really got no option but to appoint the public guardian. And when I say the public guardian is the guardian of last resort, I'm not being uh, disrespectful to the public guardian. That is the terminology in the legislation. If there's no one else, then the public guardian can do it. Or sometimes I say, if there are too many other people and they're not getting on, then the tribunal may well appoint the public guardian. As with powers of attorney, enduring guardianship is governed by state and territory legislation. And once again, there can be minor variations. So if we are moving around on a constant basis or moving interstate, we might need to look at our document and find out whether it's going to be a valid document in the other state. I said also at the outset, you know, we can make an advanced care directive. Remember, an advanced care directive, sometimes known as a living will, is a document that we prepare saying what medical treatment we would or would not want if we were to lose capacity or be unable to communicate. Because there's no legislation, there's no Advanced Care Directives Act or anything in New South Wales, um, there's no particular form. Powers of Attorney have a set form, Enduring Guardianship has a set form, but Advanced Care Directives, I say you can write on the back of a beer coaster. As long as it's clear, it's not ambiguous, so saying things like, if I've lost to pull the plug, is not really very specific or clear. Um, we have to have capacity to do it. Um, we don't want one that we made 20 years ago uh, because times change. And an advanced care directive is something that you, well, we really need to consider making in conjunction with our health professional because we might have very strong views on if I ever developed such and such a condition, I wouldn't want any treatment or whatever. And then we just mention in passing to our doctor, and they say, where have you been for the last 10 years? Don't you know that there's all this treatment now? And this is not a death sentence anymore. You think, oh, that was a bit close. Um, so, you know, an advanced care directive we can choose. I mean, New South Wales Health have got one on their website. Our friend and colleague, uh, colleague Colleen Cartwright has one on her website. But basically, we can say, you know, if I was in a persistent vegetative state, that's usually the wording in, um, used in this, then I wouldn't want to have cardiopulmonary resuscitation. I wouldn't want to have a tube in me. Uh, I wouldn't want to have peak feeding or whatever it may be. Um, and although there's no legislation in New South Wales governing them, they're governed by what we call common law. And common law is just judge-made law where something has something, some matter has gone to the Supreme Court, for example, and the Supreme Court um, has made, um, you will say, a ruling. And in New South Wales, back in 2009, there was a case um, involving a person who went into hospital um, 
was placed on renal dialysis, was not conscious, and 10 days after admission and being on renal dialysis, which is what was keeping the person alive, 10 days after the hospital found out they had, the person had an advanced care directive and the person was a Jehovah's Witness. So the last thing in the world they wanted was renal dialysis. So the hospital were in the position of saying, well, what do we do? We take him off it, he's going to die. What we'll do is we'll go to the Supreme Court with this advanced care directive the person's made and we'll get a, a direction, as it were, from the court saying whether this is valid or not valid. And so the court looked at it. It was current, it was specific, um, the person had capacity. We would say, ideally, we want a witness so that it's not a fraudulent piece of paper. In that case, the person actually hadn't signed it, but there were sufficient witnesses to say, this was his, you know, this was his. So the court said, yeah, it's a valid document. You have to adhere to what's in it. Then, oh, 2009, 2014, five years later, there was another case also in the same area of health service. And this case, I say, if you want a case that shows you how everything should be done, this case is the one. This was a 27-year-old um, guy who was quadriplegic, who made a conscious decision on his 28th, that on his 28th birthday, he wanted everything removed. He, he just wanted to be able to die you know, in dignity and comfort. And so there was the case conference in the hospital with everyone and anyone who had something to contribute, uh, including him and the solicitor, and the solicitor prepared an advanced care directive, um, the instructions of the person, and then just to make sure they decided they would go to the Supreme Court, and the solicitor was able to go through with the person all the documents that they would present in court. Went to court, the judge said, yes, it's current, it's specific, he has capacity, and it's witnessed. And so, yes, this is valid. So on his 28th birthday, everything was removed. So once again, it's up to us whether we prepare an advanced care directive. I gave a talk to a group of medicos the other night, and so I did the legal side, and a medico did you know, the medical side, and it was on enduring guardianship and advanced care directive. And then the person, the medico, said, now we're going to do some interaction. We're going to divide into pairs, one of you will be the doctor, and one of you will be the patient, and the other presenter's role was to assist the medicos in how do you initiate this conversation with your patient when they come into the surgery. So I was paired off, just having the guy next to me at the table, with a medico. I don't have an advanced care directive at the moment, but we had the conversation. So it was like talking to a GP, which reminds me, I would go to my GP and say, how come you've never had this discussion with me? Because we had the discussion about what we wanted, and to be honest, I, mean, I have a will, which I change about every 12 months. Um, I have a power of attorney, and I have an enduring guardianship, but I don't have the advanced care directive, because it's confronting. So when the guy, the medico, was asking me the questions for the first time <laughs> in my life, and this was last week, I started to think about what would I want and I was a bit amazed at what, what I wanted, which is basically what I don't want. So I thought, you know, as soon as I get over the last of these seminars and things quieten down a bit, I will sit down and do an advanced care directive. Um, and I'll make sure it's witnessed, I'll make sure it's current, it's specific, um, that I think I've got capacity, and, um, and I will have this advanced care directive. I didn't know that I could do this, or I didn't know that if I didn't do it, then this is what will happen. And so that 
is really um, the, you know, the whole purpose of this session. So that we can say, well, this is a power of attorney. It's for financial and legal matters. I can do a general one, I can do an enduring one. So why would I do the enduring? Well, just because I can and I'm looking to the future. Or, well, I don't know that I want them to have a power of attorney while I've still got capacity. Why? Well, what if they rip me off? <laughs> have you chosen the right attorney? <laughs> because if you're worried about them ripping you off when you've got capacity, what do you think they might do when you haven't got capacity? So it's looking at who we choose. It's looking at the fact that we can revoke it or cancel it at any stage, as long as we have capacity. And what we need to be mindful of is, uh, it's our money. It's our money, our assets. And if we say, oh, I, I, I feel I should appoint so-and-so, because they'll be hurt if I don't appoint them, or they'll be upset. And once upon a time, I used to say this much nicer, but now I don't. Now I say, not half as upset as you're going to be when you're sitting in the gutter eating bread and dripping. <laughs> and you think, well, that's a bit tough. Um, but think it through. How well do we know the person who is you know, our attorney or who we want to appoint as our attorney? And so, that's it, the same with the enduring guardianship. What if they're going to put me in a facility way out in the stick somewhere where I'm born and bred in the city? Or what if I'm a country person and they're going to put me in one on the middle of Parramatta Road, you know, where all I hear is not the cows, but the constant stream of traffic. Um, so it's up to us to sit down and think it through. And with the Advanced Care Directive, I'll make a commitment to myself that I do it before the end of this month. That gives me a few weeks. Um, the other point is, well, how and where do we get them? If we were in Queensland, we could go to GoPrint. We could go to Penfolds or Stationers. Um, we could go to, and I love this bit, 800 news agents around Queensland. They never name them, but it's always 800. Um, so you can get a power of attorney very easily, the actual piece of paper. In New South Wales, um, you can download the document from Land and Property Information, but there are witnessing requirements. So a general power of attorney just needs anyone to witness it, anyone who's over 18 and cited. An enduring power of attorney must have what's called a prescribed witness. And that in New South Wales is uh, an Australian legal practitioner, um, someone like a licensed conveyancer, uh, someone from a trustee company, if they've done a prescribed course, and a clerk of the court. But they often don't like to do it because when they witness it, they sign a certificate to say, I explained this enduring power of attorney to the principal and they appeared to understand it. And so if the person's filled out the form themselves and says, I just need you to witness my signature, sometimes the court staff are not too happy about witnessing it. But we can download it from there. We can see a solicitor who will explain and prepare the documents for us and witness our signature. And as I said at the beginning, we don't have to register a power of attorney unless we, and by we I mean the attorney, intends to engage in real property, that's houses um, and concrete things, uh, to engage in real property transactions. So it doesn't mean that if we appoint someone as an attorney and we, the principal, want to sell our place, um, well, we don't need to register it because we're doing it ourselves. But if the attorney is going to do the selling, the attorney must actually register the power of attorney. And there's no time frame. It doesn't matter if you do the power of attorney today, what, 7th, 7th of May, and then in six months' time, 
the attorney, for whatever reason, like my case, the attorney is going to sell the place on your instructions, um, you think, oh, but I've had this six, it doesn't matter, there's no time frame, as long as you register it before um, the property, well, you can't sell, sell it, that's the bottom line, without the power of attorney being registered. But if we're selling our own property, it's got nothing to do with the power of attorney. And our partners in the Cognitive to Client Partnership Centre, as I said, the National Health and Medical Research Council, what was um, Alzheimer's Australia, which is now Dementia Australia, and three uh, rather large aged care providers, Hammond Care, Helping Hand, and Brightwater. And that, in essence, is the end of my formal part of the presentation.